What's up, guys? Episode 8 of the Vision Board Podcast. I'm Tristan Cannell. Alongside me, as always, Johnny Stofko. What's up, guys? How are you, man? Ready to rock and roll. Let's do it. As always. Yeah, buddy. Got a special episode today. We're taking a little bit of a different approach. We've got a an entrepreneur, a very well-known entrepreneur in the fitness game, and he's obviously branching his wings into different industries now as well, but very excited to have you on. He's, he's been a bit of a mentor and influence for both of us too, would you say? Yeah, this guy, um, he's really great at uh, creating systems, and what he's done is, through his books, through his content, through his websites, basically anyone involved or, or interested in starting their own fitness-oriented business, he gives you a path and basically a plan to follow, which is worked for him and worked for other people, so I'm excited about this one. Yeah, if you're tuning in, you've probably already realized it's John Goodman that we're talking about, but before we get to John, uh, as always, just if you could please just log on to your iTunes account and just hit, hit the subscribe button and also leave us a five-star review, that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, share the love, iTunes, uh, for all you iPhone users, definitely support the cause for us. Cool. And just also, if you want to get in touch with myself or Johnny, we have a number of ebooks and also a weekly newsletter that goes out. So if you want some of my stuff, get onto my website, www.tristancanellfitness.com or for Johnny. Yeah, www.therealfitcoach.com. What you'll find, you'll find my ebooks. Sign up for my newsletter. It's all free. All we do is put your name and email in there and I'll send it straight to your inbox. Absolutely. And a big shout out to our sponsors, Jack Rabbit, Slim's Barbershop in Potts Point and The Organic Trainer. Yeah, check them out at The Organic Trainer, www.theorganictrainer.com for all your needs for tea, exercise tea, recovery tea. They also have an awesome flask that allows you to put the tea in the flask and then take the bottle with you. It's a great gift as well. And as you're proceeding to the checkout with all of your orders, type in The Fit Coach to receive 10% off of all of your orders. And if you're in the Sydney area, King's Cross, Potts Point, check out Jack Rabbit Slim's Barbershop. Set an appointment up with Dre and they'll hook you up with your beards, hair, skin fades, all that good stuff. Now guys, don't go away. We've got John Goodman right now. The Vision Board Podcast, hosted by Johnny Stofko and Tristan Cannell. Well, the Vision Board Podcast is proud to bring on Jonathan Goodman, the founder of the Personal Training Development Center. He's the author of three awesome books, Ignite the Fire, The Race to the Top, and The Online Personal Trainer Blueprint. Welcome, Jonathan. Welcome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, man. Let's Thanks for this. coming on, man. This is uh, both me and Johnny have looked up to you in the start of our personal training um, career, so really happy to have you on, man. Cool. Well, I'm honored. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Um, it's pretty interesting as well. We're in Sydney, Australia to all of our listeners. It's midnight. Uh, Jonathan is in Toronto, Canada. Yes, and it's 8 a.m. Oh, awesome. Wow, both putting in the hard yards today. That's awesome. It's a little things, <laughs> it's a little things that separate the cream will rise, right? Yeah, definitely. Exactly. Yeah. Now, John, as I touched upon before, the PTDC, the Personal Trainer Development Center, obviously is one of your leading sites, and it's one of the leading sites in the fitness industry. Can you just tell the audience about how you, you build it up to such a huge audience? For sure, yeah. I mean, it's funny because I built it up originally to try to sell my book, which is the Ignite the Fire. Like, Ignite the Fire was written first. Which I think the first lesson that really comes in there is I had 75, 77,000 words of content before I even started a site. And so if I'm going to tell anybody to sort of start a blog site or if I'm going to start a blog site, the first thing that I'll do now is I'll make sure that I have the first eight weeks of content already done before I start the site. Because the most important thing when a new site goes out is the information's really good, but also the person who's running the site can spend almost all of their time on marketing, getting the information to spread, making sure that the packaging and the positioning of the information is really on point. So I was lucky. I didn't really know what I was doing. But uh, since then, I, I kind of realized pretty quickly that, you know, as many good ideas as I had, they weren't so many. And so if I could find one or two people who had a good idea, then find like 25 of those, then the site would kind of be loaded with good ideas all throughout the year. So what I, uh, I started to reach out to people and I'm like, well, I have no audience and I have no money, so how can I get these people involved in the site? It's kind of like this catch-22, right? How do I get people involved, no audience, no money, and how do I get 
an audience with nobody involved. <laughs> and so yeah. I realized that there were a lot of people who had written really, really great stuff that was kind of stuck on their archives. As I learned more about internet marketing and building websites, I was like, most people who have a website really don't know what they're doing with it. Their websites are not built well. Their archives are not really searchable. They have all of this material that I bet gets no views. So I started reaching out to people almost blind at the beginning. You know, if I had a contact to them, I'd use that, but I almost never did. And I simply asked, I asked to get them on the phone for 15 minutes. Most of them said yes, which I was very surprised at, which was great. And then I just simply asked for permission to repurpose their old material. So I'd already gone through their blog and say, hey, look, I found these three articles. I think they're great. I, I know that they're deep in your archives. Nobody's seen them. Tell you what, I've got this collaborative blog. It's for personal trainers. Here's my greater mission. I want to improve the perception of the industry. I'd love for you to be a part of it. I've been following your work for whatever, 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 you know, compliment them. Can I repurpose these two articles? You're the sole author. Links back to you. And uh, I'll let you know when it's live. And the first 10 people that I asked, nine of them said yes. And so at that point now, I knew that I kind of had something. And so whenever a blog of that person's went live, you know, Nick Dumnella, who's become a good friend of mine, was, was somebody who did this, I'd send him a message. And I'd just say, hey, your, your blog post is live. Good job. Thank you so much. And after the third or fourth time that happened, well, all of a sudden now they shared it. You know, I, I, I want to stress, like, it wasn't the first time necessarily. But the third time, they're like, hey, I got published on the Personal Trainer Development Center. And they linked it, and they started sending their audience to us. Now, the other piece of the puzzle and something that I got really lucky with was the name. Um, the name has a intuitive understanding and explicit value associated with it. Immediately upon hearing it, you know who it's for, why it's important. And so if you're a personal trainer, you're like, oh, personal trainer development center, that's really interesting. And they'll look a little bit farther on it. And so I think all of those things kind of put together really helped it, uh, helped it grow and then just, just an abundance mindset. Awesome. Jonathan, another question I have for you is, I see in the, the title of the book, Ignite, Ignite the Fire, um, there's a metaphor there, there's a lot of meaning there. You took the time to put these words down on paper. Could you talk a little bit about that moment you had when you first picked that pen, or maybe it was the typewriter up, of that inspiration to start this? Sure. It was a moment that had been a couple years in the making. I was, I was a personal trainer, and I was like at 24 years old, 23 years old, I kind of reached the top peak of what a personal trainer could do, making about as much as you could make. I know the flow clients, you know, but I was doing what a lot of personal trainers do, which is working way too hard for still not enough money and way too many hours. So I was reading a ton about marketing, I was reading a ton about creating other income streams, all that kind of stuff that young kids do that don't know that they're entrepreneurial, but they're entrepreneurial. And I was reading a book, it was called Multiple Streams of Income. And I, but it was by a guy named Robert G. Allen, I believe. Mm. And I was on a red couch in my parents' house, and it was dark outside, it was 9.45 at night, I'd gone home from a 14-hour day of personal training, it was November 15th, wow. 2009. And I know all this because I still have the document I wrote on my computer and it's time stamped. That's awesome. So I know the exact date, right? Yeah. And, and I was reading this book and I came across the term infopreneurian and I have no idea why it caught me at that time. This is like probably a year into reading about this stuff. But it, had, it kind of showed this like picture of you write a book and then all of the income streams that can come off of the book by building a website, by hosting seminars, by doing talks, by producing other books, by producing DVDs, I mean, all of these things, having a mailing list. And I was like, I'm going to write a book. No idea what came into it. I had no idea how to write a book or anything, but just kind of started that night and, and it grew from there. Awesome. Wow. You just touched on um, building an email list. How important do you think building an email list is compared to a social media following? It's everything. The only reason you build a social media following is to drive people to your email list. Awesome. It's its own first rented platforms. I think a social media list is another point of contact with somebody, but the reality of it is you don't own a social media platform. Yeah. <coughs> you have no idea kind of what's going to happen to it. Yeah, so uh, another question I have, maybe it's more more of some um, an enlightening uh, fact about you, is the fact that Tris and I are active in the fitness industry. I don't know if you're too savvy on what's going down in uh, Australia and Sydney and Melbourne. The, the fitness industry is huge. It's everywhere. I moved here from um, I moved here from Vegas. Lived in Long Beach, California. When I got to Sydney, I was just blown away 
with how many gyms and PTs and how many schools there are for that uh, industry. And to see you doing what you're doing with the book, the website, the success without um, taking your shirt off, that's pretty impressive. Um, if you know what I mean, you know, you check Instagram, you check Facebook, and you have all these, almost these, these guys moonlighting as coaches. And it's really like, it, it's, just, it's just cool to see, um, you know, the hard work, the trench work paying off, and you're proof of it, man. So keep, up, keep that up, man. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I say yeah. that I did do a photo shoot once. I kind of have a whole bunch of rules for living that I wrote at one time, and um, one of my rules for living is get absolutely shredded once, take pictures, and never fucking do it again. <laughs> and so I did that when I lived in Hawaii a couple years ago, and I and I did the photo shoot thing, and I did the water depletion thing, and everything like that. Yeah. Um, and I posted them up, and I uh, I think the name of the photo album still is the day I reached bro status, but <laughs> it's. I mean, it's it's a funny thing because there's there's a matter of building a long term sustainable business, and then there's a way to kind of go for the quick easy win. The fitness industry, if you're a good looking dude who's pretty shredded, is relatively easy. And I say that, and I'm going to sound like kind of a joke, but it's relatively easy to make a hundred thousand bucks if you kind of know what you're doing and you look good. Mm. But so, what are you going to do tomorrow? Who are you going to help over the long term? How are you going to build a business that sustains without you, that works without you? And that's where all of the background work, that's where building a business model underneath you comes into play, which pretty much none of these people have. That's where building relationships comes into play. That's where the abundance mindset of, look, if I pull people up, then all of us are going to grow together. And I, I think that's kind of what's missing with all of this. Yeah, that, yeah I think so as well. Now, John, um, we're big on finding out who major mentors and influence are on, our, on the guests that we bring on. In terms of John Goodman's major in, in mentors and influences, who are they? I don't really have anybody, I guess, who you would look at, like, conventionally, you know, people, are, <clears throat> people look for kind of celebrities or, or thought leaders or anything like that. <laughs> I always joke, I'm like, the first time that somebody refers to themselves as a thought leader, I walk the other way. But <laughs> it's... <laughs> I mean, there, there are certainly people and things that have come into my life at the right times for me to recognize them. And one of them, it was a client of mine, Tom, and I've spoken about him time and time again, but he was a client, he's the, at that time, he was the chief of all of the medical doctors at one of the major hospitals in Toronto. He's a psychiatrist. He's now just the chief of psychiatry. And he was my client for years. He's still a very good friend. And he walked into the gym one day. This is when I was like 23. This is what started me on my whole journey. And he kind of looked at me and he smiled and he pulled a book out of his bag. And he said, you're not going to be my personal trainer for much longer. And he handed me the book. And the book was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Hmm. And so it's one of those cases where, I mean, for some reason, this guy kind of recognized that, you know, I was going to do something else. I was going to do something entrepreneurial. He didn't know what. I didn't know what. But... He knew that I needed to understand the fundamental point of there's a difference between generating wealth and investing in assets versus putting yourself in the rat race and spending money on liabilities. And that's what Rich Dad Poor Dad is all about, measuring assets and liabilities and investing in one and decreasing the other. And that kind of set me down that path. I mean, he's also the one who taught me my tools for living, which is rule number one, do a great job. Rule number two, make sure everybody knows about it. Yeah. One without the other is useless. Yeah. So, I, I mean, mentors, like, there's a lot of people like that. I have a lot of friends who I refer to as mentors, and they might refer to me as mentor. Yeah. As a mentor, I mean, it kind of goes back and forth, but there's no one person, I think, who who I kind of look at and have read all of their books and that kind of thing. I, I take a lot of pride in escaping from the world and kind of sitting with my notebooks and trying to look at things as an outsider looking in and figure out my own way to navigate through them versus trying to learn somebody else's way to kind of navigate through Awesome. To piggyback on what you said there, it's a great segue for my next question, is you're a busy guy. Um, anyone who follows the site or your IG, you're traveling. Um, I know you just got back. Are you involved in any type of, are you doing any type of meditation? Have you gotten the tanks, sensory deprivation, isolation tanks? Are you working on detaching the mind, the consciousness from the body in any sense of the way? I did do the sensory deprivation tank once in Vancouver. It took me about 57 minutes to get into it, and yeah. then I had about three minutes where I, <laughs> where I enjoyed it. Um, I did hit the side of the tank at one point, and it scared the living crap out of me. <laughs> but I do. Um, 
I, meditation takes on a couple of different forms for me. I definitely spend a lot of time, I, I guess, trying to make sense of my thoughts. If you follow one of my other kind of pet projects, it's called Bionomics, I actually interview myself all the time. Yeah. And that's how I learn. If there's a concept I'm struggling with, I kind of try to separate my brain into interviewer and interviewee. Yeah. And I ask questions and I like poke fun at each other. But my point is, is to try to understand this concept by asking questions to myself about it. So that to me is a form of meditation. I will sometimes, I mean, I, I'm fortunate that the last four winters I've been able to go to different beaches and pretty much live on them. I will sometimes go down to the ocean and, and kind of sit by the waves and listen to it and meditate and shut off. But uh, most of the time it's, it's more meditation by going by walks, meditation by just, I love paper and pen. I love the feeling of it. Um, it often, there are very few articles that I've ever written on computer. I actually write them all paper and pen, and then I what? put them into the computer. Yeah, that's if yeah, you. I did exact same. If you were on video right now, yeah. you would see uh, two journals, <laughs> pens in hand. Currently, it, there's something. <laughs> yeah, there's something organic. There's something I think. I don't want to say primitive because I mean Neanderthal man. I'm sure maybe didn't have a pen, but I guess maybe we're unwilling to go all the way the digital route. <laughs> yeah, I think so as yeah. well. I think it's a matter of, of the distractions. Uh, if you look at what a lot of authors have done, they have like old school computers with nothing else. Um, the guy who writes uh, Game of Thrones, I can't even remember his name and I've never actually read any of the books. But I, I know he writes everything on one of those Commodore 64s, one of those like computers won't even attach to the internet, you need to boot up, it's like DDoS. Yeah. But he does that because there is nothing else that can distract him. And you, you speak to a lot of very prolific writers and successful writers who are able to kind of get out of their heads and they have a very similar process. They have a computer, if they use a computer, where it is impossible for them to be distracted. Yeah, that's a great point. It's, it's, very, it's very important. <clears throat> I, I know you talk about, you write about focus. Um, how important it is to have that laser view or just the intent on an idea and then, um, you know, committing to it. <clears throat> are you, are you in, uh, so I talk about, I talk a lot about invisible tool belts, basically upskilling, doing things for our future self. 10 years from now, the future John Goodman would say, Hey man, I'm glad you did that. Whether it's, um, taking a fencing class or a poetry workshop what is the last time, what's the last thing you kind of got out of your comfort zone with outside of traveling? Oh, well, most of it's traveling. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want you to give me that answer. I need something a little bit more deeper than that. Oh, man. Tell you what, ask me another question. Let me think about that one and come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yeah. John, you touch, <laughs> on a lot of interviews, you touch a lot about mindset now. And you also talked about interviewing it yourself and getting in that zone as well. How important is it is mindset into achieving success to you? I think mindset's everything. I think that I think that you've got to put yourself in the right mindset to be able to say, okay, I need to I need to delay gratification. I need to to think and to almost take a leap of faith and say, here's what I want to do in the future, here's what I want to achieve. And here are the pieces that I need to put in place, knowing that it's gonna be probably inherently painful along the way. But learning to enjoy the process and learning to award yourself along the process. I mean, there's one of the major uh, studies that goes into this is the marshmallow study, right? The Missioner study from, I think it's the 1950s. And there, that's the one where they put one marshmallow in front of the kids and the researcher walked away and said, hey, I'm going to be back in 15 minutes. If this marshmallow is still here, I'll give you a second marshmallow. If it's eaten, you get nothing. And marshmallows are like crack to kids. Mm. And so some of the kids ate the marshmallow, some of the kids waited. But it's pretty funny because they filmed it all and the kids are like going nuts, like trying not to eat the marshmallow. They're like running in circles. But what was interesting is they then followed up on these kids for 20 years. And they found that the kids who didn't eat the marshmallow, who delayed gratification successfully, waiting for the second marshmallow, were more successful in almost every single important measure of their life, from health to wealth to relationships. Yeah. That's and the conclusion of that is very simply these kids were able to delay gratification and they're able to see the bigger picture. And so in fitness, it's very similar. You know that you want to be in shape. Well, it's inherently painful to get there. You need to delay gratification, 
having faith that you're going to be in shape later on. The same thing writing a book. It's a very difficult process and the hope that you're going to finish it. Me, on the other hand, I can't delay gratification. I would have eaten the crap out of that marshmallow. Mm. But I was still able to achieve at least some of those things. And the way that I do it is by understanding the very nature of procrastination and the very nature of understanding of, of delaying gratification and saying, okay, well, I know that I need rewards, so I'm going to build in as many small rewards as possible into this process, trying to hide myself from the fact that there's this large goal at the end. So when I write a book, I break it down into 300 to 600 word cue codes. 300 words isn't very much to write. You can whip that off really quick, right? And I have all of those cue codes. So this is like the end of the process. It takes a while to produce them, but I have all those cue codes on the right side of my computer. I sit down to write. I pick it up. I write that section. I then take that cue code and I put it face down on the other side of my computer. And what that action of successfully completing that cue code and putting it face down on the computer, that's my reward. And then you see the one pile going down and the one pile going up. And it's almost like a status bar in a game. And that pulls me along the process. And I know that once the cue codes are done, I'm done my book, but I never really have to think about it. And so I think it's, it's just kind of an understanding those, those principles and understanding myself and learning, okay, where am I good and where am I not so good? And I know that I'm a procrastinator, so how can I kind of fix that? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Uh, Branson talks about it, it, uh, the last book I read that he wrote, Richard Branson, is about he doesn't have, he talks about success and the things that separate the unsuccessful and the successful. And he says simply, if you could be honest with yourself and write down the things that you're good at and write down the things that you need work on and obsess over the things that you need to work <laughs> on, you'll be successful. You know, it's that same thing about be, just, I guess, being honest with yourself and then putting the work in. Yeah, so. I think for sure. I think I think understanding oneself is probably the most important thing you can do. I mean, there's there's lots of books written about it. I mean, A Man's Search for Meaning and all that kind of stuff. But if you look at any great fiction book, at its core, it is a journey where the character is learning about themselves. They may encounter all of these crazy things, but, I mean, look at one of my favorite stories of all time, Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> the final scene. Yeah. Right? You're all just a pack of cards. Yeah. She realizes that all of the stuff that's going on is just in her head, and the whole book is is a young girl's search to understand herself, pretty much. Yeah. And and any good fiction story is that. And I, I, I don't think that there's anything more important than, yeah. I mean, exactly what you guys are yeah. talking about. Right? Yeah, I, I like the idea. I, uh, one of the things I used to struggle with was um, I'm really open-minded in terms of whether someone's belief. I'm not going to be that guy to say, I don't believe in that, I don't believe in that. I'll research it. But when you hear people um, talk about um, the importance of positive thinking, the importance of being around people who support you, and then what you think, you know, manifest destiny, begins to create its reality in front of you, um, we are the creators, per se. What's your opinion on that? I think, you're, I, I think there are a lot of things in your control. I think the most important thing to understand is that um, aside from tragedies, I mean, let's eliminate like major tragedies yeah. from this. Obviously, that's a completely different ballgame, but most of our experiences and the way that we encounter our experiences are only in reference to something else that we already know or know how it feels. And so our emotions are driven by, uh, by reference points. So if you have, and there's been a lot of studies, even pain, for example, uh, there's been a lot of studies where people who have taken soldiers and given them an electric shock, soldiers who have like been in battle and gotten limbs chopped off, given them an electric shock, and then they've taken regular people who have never seen combat or whatever, and given them the same electric shock, and the soldiers gave like a 2 out of 10, I'm going to butcher the stats, <laughs> but the soldiers gave like a 2 out of 10 in the pain scale, and the regular people gave like a 9 out of 10 in the pain scale. And so something like pain is subjective, but even if we enjoy something or don't enjoy something is subjective. You talked about how I like to travel. The main reason why I like to travel is because it helps me see things in ways that I wouldn't otherwise see them, and one of them is by setting reference points. The best way to appreciate something is to encounter some sort of hardship. And so yeah. if we encounter more hardships and we set our reference points lower, then we're going to appreciate things more. You know, yeah. if I go into a coffee shop, here in Toronto, and I walk in and I can seamlessly order an Americano with two shots black, 
I really appreciate that experience because I know how freaking difficult that is to order that same coffee in Uruguay where nobody speaks a word of English, and I have no clue what I'm going to get at the end of the day. I also know that I'm going to look like an idiot, probably be rude, and probably end up with something that I don't want. Mm. And so that low reference point makes me really appreciate an everyday occurrence. So I think I think those, I mean, in terms of, of learning to appreciate, learning to enjoy things, <laughs> that's kind of the key to it. Yeah, yeah. very important. D is it tough for you? Ever, like w w the reference points you mentioned, um, there's an article, I'm, I, I don't want, I'm, I forget her name, but she writes about the levels of happiness <laughs> and she talks about the highest level of happiness always contains some sort of suffering. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, when you're looking at your travels, you said the Uruguay thing, was there ever, was there a moment where you were like in the moment and you were so aware of it, you know, you were like, this moment sucks, but I'm going to look back and be like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to like cradle that as a good thing in the future because it made you grow. Yeah, I mean, my, my girlfriend and I are pretty good at picking each other up. Congrats on that, by the way. Yeah, thank you. I saw it's, that. It's yeah. Rare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you post you post the other day. I was like, how do I slip that one in? But yeah, man, when you find somebody and you you, you even have that question come up, you know, you got to you got to uh, cherish that. So congrats on the uh, taking the next step. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, one of the special things I think that we have is it's pretty rare that we'll both kind of be in a funk, and we both understand enough about this kind of stuff. A, a lot of what we've spoken about that. We're able to look at the other one and say, hey, idiot, get out of it. <laughs> or, hey, it's not so bad. So it's pretty rare that we'll say, hey, this sucks, and this is going to suck, and we're going to think about how much this sucks, but we're going to kind of feel better. Um, often what we'll do is we have this trick. I learned it from uh, a humorist named Loretta LaRoche, who I saw on stage. Who, I mean, she's great if you ever get a chance to watch what's, her. But what's the name again? Loretta LaRoche. Okay. I'll give you a link to her stuff afterwards if you awesome. want. Awesome. Yeah, do that. But one of the things she did on stage, first of all, she had a room of 3,500 people singing um, a pie in the sky together holding hands, swaying back and forth within about 40 minutes, which was pretty cool. But she, she said, look, there's something you all need to know. Nothing sucks if you spin. You'll always smile and laugh if you spin. She's like, <laughs> had a shitty day? Spin. Dog dies? Spin. And she just... And, and it's true, and it's funny for anybody who knows me, like, I'll kind of just spin in a circle anytime I feel myself being in a funk. And the minute that we do that, we're just like, yeah, it's pretty, you know, stuff's not so bad. Yeah. So there's kind of little tricks like that. I mean, a smile, even. If you force yourself to smile, you get that dopaminergic effect in your brain, and all of a sudden you're not so sad anymore. Like, you can kind of, you can kind of work this stuff out. Your brain does stupid things, but you can, you can trick it right back. Yeah, yeah, nice, no, definitely, man. Now, John, can you leave us with some words of inspiration just for our, for our listeners? Maybe like a young entrepreneur looking to start up a business or maybe that young person just looking to take the next step in their career? Sure. I mean, I think the most valuable thing that I can pass on are the, are the two rules that were passed on to me by, by Tommy years back, which was, you know, number one, do a great job. Number two, make sure everybody knows about it. Yeah. And, and I think that no matter what industry you're in, I mean, certainly in the fitness industry, but no matter what industry you're in, you kind of have a responsibility to do both. And you kind of can't do one without the other. And so, of course, doing a great job means that you need to be good enough in what you're doing that you need to be able to help who you say that you're going to be able to help. Does that mean you need to be the utmost expert? Absolutely not. But you need to know enough to know who you can influence, what kind of effect you can have, and what kind you can't. And at various stages of the game, that will change, obviously. And then the second one is just saying, okay, well... How do I get my message out? I mean, when it comes to content promotion, I would say that content content isn't really valuable anymore. Context isn't really valuable anymore. What's really important is that you know how to package and position your content. And so you could take something that's already produced, you can make it sound and feel a little bit better, and you can get it to do better than the original piece of content, simply by giving it a better headline, better picture, and by positioning it a little bit better, finding that hook. So just learning that stuff, learning old school copywriting and advertising techniques. Um, I think I think those are probably the two most valuable skills, to be honest, for any industry. Yeah, cool. And Jonathan, before we let you go, could you give, a, uh, for our listeners who don't know who you are, could you give them um, where we could find you at online? Sure. The 
for anybody who's a fitness professional, the personal trainer development center, it's the PTDC. You have to put the the before, or else you're going to hit the Pakistani tourism development center. Actually, I hit that they won't give me the name. Yes, yeah. Right. yeah. You hit it? Yeah. yeah, yeah I know. Uh, those jerks. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, you're interested, if you're interested in more of the web stuff, my experiments, I mean, really, it's a passion project. It's where I write about kind of what I'm thinking about or what I'm doing online. Uh, I have a blog that I call Vionomics. And I have a book coming out under that name as well that should be out in a couple weeks, depending on when this is coming out. Um, January 2016 is when that will be out. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I think I got an email about that the other day. On the newsletter. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome, John. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure speaking to you. You're one of our, both of our, um, we talk about influencers and mentors at the moment. Yeah, you're definitely one of ours. So we really appreciate you coming on today, man. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot for your time, John. Thank you guys, had fun. You too, uh, have man. a good one. We'll speak soon. Well, it's different. He, he had a different way of bringing out his own. Yeah, he was a good talker. Own, yeah, you can tell he's a public speaker. Yeah, good speaker. Um, it takes his time. I like how he referenced people. It's a different one for us too because it's yeah. a cross sort of um, between someone that we've taken a lot from. Yeah, man, a lot of the stuff that, that he was saying. Is, like, I remember when you talked to me, like, the when he was talking about about 10 minutes in, about the content, oh, before he released the site, he already had the book. Yeah. He was like, if you don't have eight weeks of content, yeah, exactly. you're not ready to. You're not ready for the site. You, is that where you picked that up when you, you yeah. were giving me that? A lot of the stuff. Little like, help? Even like, do a great job. Yeah. That's something you can control. Yeah, make sure everyone knows about. It. That's kind of what we say when we, you know, our goal for the gym, the well, health we club. We want to help people. Like, that's, yeah. Let people know about it because someone else might get something out of it. Man. Yeah, like I, you know, my goal isn't to be the busiest the busiest coach in the health club, but my goal is that everybody in that health club knows my name. Definitely. I think that's really important, and that's a testament to the job, the work, the things I do outside the club. Yeah. It's those little things. It's like being here right now. But you're um, trying to be the best version of Johnny. Yep. So that's probably why you do that, and that's the best way for you to show your talents to the world, is to do that, to be socially active, continually promoting not only your brand, I think what we do differently to other people is we don't really need a following, so to say. We just want to provide some value, some content that people might find fresh. Yeah, I always say it. If one person listens to what we say or reads something you write or reads something that I write and then responds to our email or my private message and says, hey, man, I, thanks for that. that. That really helped me. I was in a funk. Thank you. And if it's just one person from now until the day I die, I've done my job. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and, and I feel that's the secret to people out there who are who are wanting, um, you know, questioning what they should be doing with their life, with their career. They need to sit down with themselves, be honest with themselves, and find out what it is that makes them tick and, and what makes them feel good about themselves. And if it's helping people, do it. If it's writing, do it. Um, don't don't let the idea of time hold you back. Absolutely. And information sharing, like the amount of information he just shared with us. Oh my God. It was valuable. Yeah, as, as I like well, I like what Eric yeah. Thomas says. Information changes the situation. Exactly. Don't I'm be scared to because at the end of the day it's gonna be your work rate, your work ethic that's gonna separate you. I could give you like I could give you every single thing I did. Yeah. But it doesn't mean anything unless you apply it. So Yeah. At the end of the day, it's how you execute. Applicate okay, yeah, execution, prep well, prep preparation, preparation execution, execution, application. Yeah. And, um, constant review and, and constant understanding that there's a need to get better. Yeah. And a need, if you're going to produce some content, if you're going to release an article, if you're going to write a book, you better be prepared that the next thing that's expected from you is going to be above that. Like you, it's important to even it's the stepping stones. Like yeah. we've spoken about plenty of times, yeah. stepping stones to meeting people, your network, to even just releasing little articles from a small article to a big article to a big article to being. Uh, published in one magazine on a site you know it's just different little stepping stones that yeah that I like to take in life yeah it's it, it's good like we didn't get too much into you know goal setting or vision boards but you could tell he's the type of dude that he's always reading he talked about psychology a lot you can tell and that he's constantly improving himself and he has two day. those two rules so I think that's important for anyone too is those two rules whether there's two whether there's one whether there's ten all that is saying is that you have you're holding yourself accountable to something that's greater than you. Yeah. You're holding yourself accountable to expectations that you're putting on yourself. And without those expectations, 
how are you ever going to, you, you know, reach your full potential? That's his foundations as well. He created his foundations off those two goals that he's still holding from when he was from 10 years ago. I mean, that's why he's success, so successful today because those foundations, which obviously work for him, it just applied to his business day in, day out, day yeah. in, day out. And like you said, from one of the, like even the way he started the PD, uh, PTDC, the way he's reached out to people, it's getting out of his comfort zone. Like yeah. You did touch upon, we didn't get to cover yeah, the, the comfort zone <laughs> question. I sent him a message. Yeah, we'll probably get that on the next time he, he appears. Yeah, once that book comes out. Even doing that, like he didn't have anyone to, he started it by himself to reach out to people and he really didn't have anything to offer but a platform. Yeah. I, th I think it's, exce I mean, it's, it's the greatest compliment to Goodman when you see people taking his um, blueprint. Yeah, absolutely. Because we've had, in the Sydney area, you and I, just in the last month or so, we had a guy reach out to us, and hearing John explain his methodology, that's exactly what this gentleman is doing as well in Sydney with reaching out to coaches, reaching out to PTs, asking them to borrow their uh, content, Posting and publishing for them on his mm -hmm. platform. It's the same thing and it's cool to uh, To be in cahoots uh, in the circle of people that aren't reinventing the wheel But they're delivering it with a different edge different mm -hmm. angle And he spoke about that about delivering it a little bit differently putting your own spin on things Like we said like a lot of this stuff's been inventing before you're not going to invent anything now It's 2015 which is about to be 2016. We're not inventing anything new, but you can still improve on the processes from before and even kind of, you know, not rewrite something, but just you know, put your own spin on something and, you know, continually push that information because it might just get lost for a few years and then bring it back out and then it's fresh again, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think the thing that I take the most from um, this podcast, which um, one of my favorites so far is how important it is to be authentic, authenticity. To be authentic, to not... To not um, want to go down someone else's path mm. because the, the, that path already has footprints why not choose your own path and, and realize that if somebody has done something if somebody has invented something if somebody has created something you could do it yeah there, there's no like they're not better than you yeah. there's no one that's more special more greater than you you have the capabilities you have the talent to do whatever whatever it is inside that you want to do you just mm. have to you have to look for it it's not easy um, I read a lot about, you know, it's, it, they're not, it, it's not a voice screaming at you. It's not a voice at night saying, Tristan, Tristan, do this. It, it's more like a whisper. Yeah. It's more like, you, you know, that, 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 that tiny voice that you can only hear every now and then. I think that, once you tune into that, what that is, and um, ours is empowering, educating, inspiring people, and giving them a platform to realize that there isn't, you know, we've had world champions on, we've had contenders on, we've had successful entrepreneurs on, and the common denominator is, man, everybody is the same. Yeah. There's not one person that's lacing their shoes up with a third hand. Huh. Um, you know, so I think that's really important. Once you realize that you could do, you know, anything you put your minds to do it, yeah. it's important. But it's also great to surround yourself with successful people, such as John, Jeff Fennick in the one episode before, Dane on the episode before that, because they give a different perspective on things. It's also great sometimes when you do meet people like this. I think for both of us too as well on this episode here, we listened a lot more than we spoke, which I think is huge. You take in a lot more when you're actually listening to someone, especially someone as successful as John. You learn more, man. Yeah, I know the one thing that I work on the most with myself with the uh, countless hours of leadership that I've taken, um, countless courses, and the one thing I keep reverting back to is when I, I'm, my, I'm my hardest critic. I, sometimes I can't even listen to myself speak because I'm still learning on how to filter, learning on how to pull the reins back, but everyone says the best leaders, they lead with their ears. Everyone's had that boss that shouts orders and they force you to fall in line. No one wants to follow that guy. Mm. People want to follow the guy who sits back and listens. Listens, takes perspective, views the situation. Yeah, awesome points, Johnny. Like I couldn't agree anymore. So I think we've come up with there spot on. But uh, I know you guys have enjoyed that show. You must have. John Goodman's a G. Well, me and Johnny have just been speaking about. And that's some valuable stuff. And we're all about information sharing. So if you could just help us out, get on that iTunes, subscribe, leave a little review for us. We'll just keep getting guys like John Goodman on each week, Johnny. Yeah, that's that's very important. Um, 
Keep supporting the movement. Like I always say, we really appreciate all the support and the feedback we've been getting. Um, what I need you to do and Tristan needs you to do is go to our website. So you can go to mine at www.therealfitcoach.com and just subscribe to the newsletter. What this will allow you to do, you'll have access to my free ebooks, but also you'll be in the loop in terms of our guests coming on. We ask um, some question, question and answers for our followers and listening listeners, so you might get a shout-out on one of our episodes. Yeah, most definitely. Or you can hit me up at www.tristancanalfitness.com. Between the two of us, there's so much resources there, guys. To so jump on, it's free. It's no obligation. You're only going to get good stuff. So jump on. Most of my mates, my family, my clients, they are all on there. And they're all they're all getting that value each week. So. Yeah. What it's what also it's doing is that I get a lot of um, ideas, uh, things to read from that email list from um, followers emailing me. Hey Johnny, check this one out. Johnny, read this. So what it also is is an, it's a platform to share different ideas as well. Yeah, definitely. And as we did mention the the question and answer segment, that's a big part of our show. So we want to hear from you each week. So send questions to the Vision Board Podcast at gmail dot com, or you can find our individual emails. We're more than happy to answer any questions you've got and actually feature them on the show. We'll give them a little shout out as well. So if you want to be featured on the show, please get in touch. It's an easy email. Um, so yeah, do it now. Yeah, send me an email at Johnny at the real fit coach dot com. If you follow me on Instagram, you can find me at the underscore fit coach. Absolutely, man. But um, yeah, that was an awesome episode. Like we said. We're going to keep bringing these awesome people on. Next episode, we've got John Wayne Parr. We've got Billy Dib. We've got Austin Trout. John Wayne Parr, for you guys that don't know, Austin Trout as well. Billy Dib, a world champion. John Wayne Parr is like Bruce Lee of Australia. He's an absolutely living legend, and I'm very excited about this one. Yeah, if you haven't seen his documentary prior to uh, listening to our show, check out his documentary on YouTube because it's, it's outstanding. Yeah, you could catch him on Rogan's too. If you guys listen to our podcast, some of our followers listen to Rogan's, the Joe Rogan Experience. He's been on John Wayne Park a couple times. This guy has coached the likes of George St. Pierre in terms of Muay Thai and kickboxing, so he's an elite, elite human. Absolutely, man. So before we go, big shout out to our sponsors again, Jackrabbit Slim's Barbershop at Potts Point and also The Organic Trainer. Yeah, www.theorganictrainer.com. When you're proceeding to check out with all your goods, type in The Fit Coach to receive 10% off of all of your orders. If you're in the Sydney area, check Dre out at Jackrabbit Slim's Barbershop in Kings Cross and Potts Point. Awesome, man. I'll catch you later, Johnny. Yeah, man. I will see you when I see you. Say bye. Peace. The Vision Board Podcast, hosted by Johnny Stofko and Tristan Cannell.